Hello, good afternoon, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm delighted to see so many people here to, uh, to welcome Christina uh, Boswell to inaugurate uh, my good friend and colleague, uh, Professor Christina Boswell, to her uh, chair in politics. Um, and it's a, a great honor to do that because I'm Joe Shaw, I'm the Dean of Research, and Christina has been acting for the last couple of years as the Deputy Dean of Research in the College of Humanities and Social Science, and I think many people have enjoyed very much working with Christina during that time. Um, anyway, so we're here primarily, though, to celebrate Christina's academic achievements, um, which are, are many and varied. Um, Christina uh, originally did um, PPE at Oxford and then a master's at uh, the College of Europe in, in Bruges and then a PhD, uh, more in political theory and international relations at the London School of Economics. And so she's been on a bit of an academic journey since then, uh, partly because she spent quite a lot of time in Germany after a period working at Chatham House. She then spent a fair amount of time in Hamburg, uh, establishing really her own research career as an independent researcher with Marie Curie money and then uh, with a Marie Curie Excellence Grant, which is in essence the, uh, the original uh, starter grant, ERC starter grant. So already by the time Christina came here as a lecturer in 2006, she was already very well established as a principal investigator. And I think many of us have have, have co really come to know and respect um, her, her work, her work uh, mentoring uh, early career colleagues who she's worked with, mentoring PhD students, uh, developing a number of uh, collaborative activities, including the Migration and Citizenship Research Group, which I very much enjoyed uh, cooperating with her on and uh, working with an, uh, within a number of seminar series and other similar types of activities, which, um, being Christina, always have outputs, always have ends, um, and the, the, the process is extremely enjoyable, but the, uh, the outcome is, is, is clear, it's always going to happen. And one of the big outcomes and ends that Christina has achieved over the last um, uh, five years or so has been the publication of her Cambridge University Press book, The Political Uses of Expert Knowledge, Immigration Policy and Social Research. And you'll see from the t title of tonight's knowledge, which is uh, the tonight, uh, tonight's uh, lecture, that she's also still um, working, or the content of tonight's lecture is she's still working with the knowledge paradigm quite a lot, but still uh, working on the various different academic inputs into that, not only from her, her original disciplines of, of, of international relations, but more increasingly more from, from organizational sociology and now working with psychologists and econ economists in a new branch of your work in one hopes in the future. But anyway, uh, she's uh, recently been awarded an, an ESRC grant to expl explore the politics of monitoring. And tonight she's going to uh, talk to us about um, against interests in political science, public policy and political motivation. Uh, so Christina's going to talk for around 45 minutes um, and then uh, she's not going to take questions. Rather, on the contrary, we're going to go outside and celebrate in the traditional way um, her achievements. Um, Christina, Christina Boswell, Professor of Politics. Thanks very much, Joe. I think you've basically said everything now, so I might as well get my coat and go home. No. Um, it's, it's really quite something to be standing up here, actually, and seeing all these familiar and very dear faces of family and friends and, and colleagues. Um, and I think it's especially appropriate um, to be standing in this building, the Adam Ferguson building, because this was the building that uh, I first worked in when I arrived at Edinburgh in 2006. Um, and I really, in a sense, felt that I'd found my intellectual home because I've really loved working with colleagues across the different disciplines within social science. Um, but when I first uh, moved here, it looked a bit more like this and like this. <laughs> I actually procured these photographs from my husband, Alex, who works at the um, architect firm that has done up the building subsequently. And it's obviously looking a lot nicer today. Um, but at the time, it was a bit of a, a joke amongst colleagues working in the School of Social and Political Studies because it was in such a dilapidated state. And now we enjoy our new building across the square. And of course, it looks completely different here. But I just thought it was particularly nice and special to be standing in this building today because of the importance of the school, I think, for, for my ongoing work, and also because of this special link with Alex, who's, who's sort of taught me to appreciate 60s brutalist architecture in a way that I didn't before. Um, but on to more serious matters. Um, so 
the topic I want to talk about today is in some ways very familiar because I've, I've been grappling with the concept of interest in political science in some way or other for most of my academic career. But I hadn't really identified it as a unifying strand in my work until I, I, I was working on a grant application quite recently and, and I was forced to, to say something about my research trajectory. Um, and then it kind of dawned on me that one of the things I've been doing from different angles, from different sort of pitches over the last 15, 16 years has really been to critique um, quite a, a widespread, ubiquitous uh, concept which is deployed within political science. It's quite kind of foundational to mainstream political science. Um, and although the concept of interest is quite ubiquitous within political science, it's almost so taken for granted and so normalised that, that, that people don't often pin down what they mean by interest um, and they don't discuss its role or its function within their theory of politics or political motivation. So what do we mean by interest? Well, interest obviously has multiple meanings and in everyday usage we can talk about having an interest in something uh, as an object of curiosity or concern. I'm interested in literature, or I'm interested in the football results. Uh, but in contemporary political science and social science more generally, interest is usually taken to refer to some aspect of welfare. So it implies an evaluation of what is good or advantageous to me. So for example, I might have an interest in securing an adequate pension. Um, but it's also often taken to mean what others might perceive my interests to be, even if I don't agree with them. For example, you might think I have, or Alex might think I have an interest in cutting down my consumption of chocolate ice cream um, in the interests of my long-term <laughs> health, but I might not agree with that. So it can be a judgment about welfare made by myself or, or by other people um, about what's good or advantageous to me. But there's a further second usage of interest which complicates the picture, and that's the notion that interest isn't only used to evaluate what's good or advantageous, but it's used to explain behaviour. Um, so if, uh, interests are frequently taken to imply reasons for action. And this can work in two possible directions. On the one hand, if we observe that people have particular interests, we can expect that, that, that those interests will drive a certain type of action or behaviour. Um, or we can observe them to have interests and then encourage them to, 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 to act in a way that advances those interests. But it can also work in the other direction, that we can observe people behaving or acting in a certain way and then infer a certain interest from that behaviour. So, for example, if we observe people voting UKIP, we might infer that they have an interest in reducing immigration or um, Britain leaving Europe. So there's a qu quite kind of complex picture of the different uses of interest in political science. And both of these uses of interest are quite, as I said, are quite widespread within political science. Um, for example, attempts to explain political behaviour <coughs> frequently invoke some concept of interest. So it's, it's assumed that voters vote for the party which best advances their interests. It's assumed that people come together um, uh, people with shared interests come together to form interest groups and to lobby um, uh, policymakers. It's assumed that policymakers pursue elite interests and that countries act in the national interest. So this concept of interest is quite rife within um, political science. Um, but there's also an idea that politics itself as a process is conceived of as a conflict between rival interests. And this is the idea that individuals and groups assert rival interests which are then mediated or brokered or accommodated through a political process and then transformed into policies or outputs. So, and I, I don't know why I chose this slide, it's a little bit random, but it's this idea I think of brokering uh, interests and sort of mediating conflicting interests. So why would I want to critique such an intuitively appealing and, and sort of widely um, uh, widely held idea about the centrality of interests in political science. Well, what I propose to do this evening is not, I'm not going to set out a logically, um, a tightly structured, logically sequenced critique of interest, um, but I want to make the critique a bit more autobiographical. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, 
talk about three different phases of my research, all of which can be associated with a, with a different critique of interest. So it's a slightly more circuitous line of argument. So I'm going to just present these three strands of research associated with a different phase and then hopefully weave them together at the end in some coherent fashion. Um, so starting with the first phase, this is uh, work on the ethics of refugee policy. Um, so this journey really starts at the London School of Economics, um, where I was doing PhD research. And I've been working for the UNHCR for a couple of years, uh, the UN High Commission for Refugees, for a couple of years um, after graduating, including in Burundi. And that's a picture of a, a refugee camp in Burundi. And this was the mid-1990s. And a lot of the debate going on at the time within the UN um, was about how to encourage states, and particularly richer countries who are receiving um, refugees to accept greater numbers of refugees. So my PhD was going to be on the ethics of refugee policy and, and specifically what I saw as a problem of motivation in refugee policy. So what was this problem of motivation? Well, international refugee law says that states have a duty to grant asylum to those fleeing persecution or violence in their countries of origin. And this international legal commitment um, is grounded in a long and very influential tradition of liberal thought. And this is the notion that we should extend human rights or assistance to others regardless of their nationality, ethnicity or other particular characteristics um, which are not assumed to be morally relevant. Um, so we have moral duties to those beyond our borders um, regardless of their place of origin and that includes uh, moral duties to refugees fleeing persecution. But in practice, um, of course, there's clearly a gap between the demands of refugee law, um, which codifies this long-standing tradition of, of liberal thought, and what governments or their citizens seem to be motivated to do. Now, one way of looking at this gap of motivation is to simply throw up your hands and concede, well, governments and their voters are selfish, and their behaviour simply falls short of the standards of, of liberal ethics. Um, but what troubled me in this debate was this constant juxtaposition between, on the one hand, this notion of interest, what we really want to do, or the idea of national interest, and ethical duty. So on the one hand, you have these interests, which in this case are all about protecting the welfare of one group of people from the demands of outsiders, and on the other hand, you have this idea of an ethical position which requires people to somehow renounce these interests and behave in a selfless, altruistic way. So it seemed to me, as an attempt to motivate people to adopt a more generous refugee policy, this approach was pretty much doomed from the outset, or at least when set up in this dichotomous, um, uh, uh, dichotomous way. Now, this dichotomy between interest, and in particular self-interest and altruism, has a long and venerable tradition in liberal um, political thought. Um, Kant most famously catches it when he talks about a distinction between the will and moral duty. Um, and more recently, the philosopher Thomas Nagel sets out a contemporary version of this idea um, in his book, The Possibility of Altruism. You should remember this, Kitty, um, from first year <laughs> BP. Um, uh, he argues that adopting an ethical course of action involves abstracting from one's personal interests and ties and relationships and adopting an impartial perspective. The moral agents no motivated not um, from generosity or compassion or empathy, but because she recognises that this is the morally correct course of action, and she recognises that through her capacity for reason. Um, but what a strange idea. I've always thought this is a completely bizarre idea. How could a person be motivated to behave in an ethical way by stepping outside of her personal attributes and dispositions and relationships? Surely it's precisely these traits that provide the resources for behaving in an ethical way. But for those in the Kantian tradition, and this is probably the majority of contemporary political theorists, it seems we have this very powerful motivational force, this will, or uh, what might we, we might now term interest or, or um, egoism. And on the other hand, there's this sort of self-abnegating, entirely unself-regarding thing called duty. Um, and 
juxtapose these two sort of extreme um, stylized versions of, of the sort of the, the self-interest and the duty. Um, and we're supposedly drawn to the, to the duty bit, the sort of martyrdom side, through a process of reasoning. And the source of motivation um, to engage in that process of reasoning and to behave morally is left um, completely obscure. Um, now, there are some alternative ways of thinking about moral motivation, and a number of philosophers, including our own Scottish Enlightenment thinkers, David Hume and, and Adam Smith, um, located the capacity for ethical behaviour or morality in sympathy. So it was our capacity for sympathy that motivated morality. And more recently, a number of feminist and psychoanalytic um, accounts have, have, have drawn on a related notion of empathy to explain moral behaviour. And I think unpacking, just briefly unpacking this notion of empathy, I think um, can give us some clues about why the interest altruism dichotomy misses the mark. So where does the capacity for empathy come from? It's not a quality developed in isolation, but it emerges through relations with others. And now I have a completely gratuitous baby photo <laughs> of one of my, one of my, my uh, elder daughter with Alex. But the point, the point is, and it is relevant to what I'm going to say, I mean, it, it starts with babies. Um, and to put it in the simplest terms, infants need recognition and love from their carers in order to develop a capacity to feel concern for others. And as they develop, they move from a, from a state of total dependence on their carers to one of awareness of their separateness and eventually recognition of others as having their own separate states and desires. I'm sure I'm getting my mother's nodding at this stage, so I must be getting something right. So they learn to put themselves in their shoes and recognise their claims as in some sense equally deserving. In this way, um, attachment to those around them, to their primary carers, develops from this, this state of sort of helpless dependence to a recognition of difference and separateness and a capacity to empathise with these separate others. So how does this capacity for empathy, which I've just described, in relation to those in our immediate sphere, how does that come to be channeled into more complex forms or more abstract notions of rights and justice? Um, and here it's useful to draw on work by George Herbert Mead, a philosopher and social psychologist um, working in the first half of the 20th century. Um, and I just looked to my psychology colleague here to see if this is kosher <laughs> with, with my psychology um, colleagues. Um, Mead developed a theory of how individuals absorb norms and values from their environment. And he described this um, through a process of role taking. So he describes how humans internalize social norms through this role taking, through observing themselves through the eyes of others. So through this process of sort of observing your own behavior through the eyes of, 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 through imagining yourself through the eyes of the other, you're able to adjust your attitudes and behavior to reflect the values and the norms of those around you. So put in really simple terms, you, you internalize the, the values of those around you and adjust your action to conform to these. And obviously this is a very, very, very simple <laughs> picture I'm painting here. Um, now in, si in societies with a strong liberal democratic tradition, so with that strong tradition of thinking about ethics in this sort of liberal universalist way, we would expect such norms to include norms about universal rights and duties to extend assistance to those beyond our borders. So the ability to recognize and be motivated by these norms isn't grounded in a capacity for reason, although that has something to do with it. But it's the result of a process of internalizing a particular tradition of liberal ethics, which remains profoundly influential in Western liberal societies. Um, and this development of a capacity for moral action and, and for a capacity to recognize and be motivated by duties to refugees um, is closely bound up with the idea of recognition. And this is going to be important for, for, for what follows in this lecture. So firstly, the recognition we receive um, through our very first relationships enables us to develop this empathic disposition, which provides the basis for a motivation to extend concern, empathy, consideration to others. And this empathic disposition is then channeled or given direction through a process of internalizing shared norms about appropriate behavior. And it's this process that enables us to adopt norms that imply more far-reaching duties to those beyond our borders, such as refugees. 
That was what I argued in my PhD anyway. Um, sorry. So where does this leave interest? Let's bring it back to interest. Well, interest on this account is exposed as rather irrelevant in making sense of moral behavior. Moral action isn't about suppressing or abstracting from interests or self-interests. Um, this motivation to extend duties to others derives from this empathic disposition and it doesn't make sense to classify this disposition as either self-interested or altruistic. It's rooted in a process of mutual recognition um, which enables the development of empathy and leads us to internalise shared norms. So interests rather fall out of the picture. They're exposed is irrelevant. So I'll leave aside this first critique for a minute. We'll return to it later. I just want to move on to phase two. Um, now, after my PhD, I became rather frustrated with what I saw as the limitations of political theory. Um, and my work became a bit more empirical, and I worked much more on immigration and asylum policy. Um, and as Joe said, I, I did a postdoc in Germany um, at the University of Hamburg for a couple of years. And then I um, got in touch with um, an economist called Thomas Straubhaar, who is a quite well-known uh, migration specialist in Hamburg. And he was quite keen on setting up an interdisciplinary research group within, within his institute. It was called the Hamburg Institute for, Economic, for International Economics. So I decided to move there, maybe against my better judgment. It was a slightly odd move, slightly odd fit for me. Um, but we got some funding um, for a team, a multidisciplinary team of, of, of social scientists working on a project on um, migration decision making, and in particular the dynamics of East West European migration and the sort of decision making uh, process of migrants in, in that context. And as I said, we were a bit of an anomaly um, in this uh, economics institute. Um, and my colleagues obviously seemed to be committed to a rather different notion of decision making. And I felt um, that we should somehow get our differences out in the open. And I decided to organize this conference about um, different assumptions about decision making across different social sciences, um, sort of comparing economics and more sociological approaches. So we organized this conference. I think I had this rather naive belief that I would somehow convert them to a, to a more reasonable point of view, <laughs> um, which was obviously didn't work. Um, but <laughs> um, the, the paper that I presented at, at that conference um, set out a critique of what has been termed um, Homo economicus. Oh, there's a picture of Hamburg. There's the, the institutes, that, that building on the right there. Um, very attractive place if you ever get a chance to visit. Um, so the, the, the paper that I set out was this critique of this um, model of decision making, which is widely applied in, in neoclassical economics and rational choice theory within um, political science. Um, now, one important feature of Homo economicus um, is his egoism. So individuals are motivated by self-interest and they seek to maximize um, their own interest or their utility. Um, so this implies that above all, individuals are kind of driven by this psychological disposition to promote their own well-being or happiness. Um, a second important claim of Homo economicus um, is what, what we can term the atomism claim. And this isn't so much a, a claim about <coughs> the, the inherent sort of the, 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 the disposition or, or um, uh, nature of, of individuals, but it's more about how best we can study and understand their action. Um, and the idea is that social science involves studying individual preferences and behavior um, rather than, say, institutions or systems or shared norms or values or culture. And this, in turn, implies that the appropriate methodology for studying um, uh, social behaviour is the observation and analysis of individuals and their attitudes and, um, and their behaviour. Now, this model of behaviour has been doing the rounds since the 1900s or so, when the discipline of economics first emerged. And the critique of this model is just as old and just as familiar. Um, in fact, Weber probably <laughs> provided the most succinct and I think best critique of the model as far back as 1898. So it's not my job here to, to sort of put, you know, reinvent the wheel and, and critique this model. But I do want to just focus on some of the assumptions being made about interests according to this model. 
So the first claim that individuals are motivated by egoism. Well, it's worth noting that this quite narrow conception of interest um, is a relatively recent development within social science. And as sociologists such as Hirschman and Swedberg have argued, in the 17th and 18th centuries, um, social and political theorists had a far broader idea about what types of interests might drive behaviour. So the concept of interest encompassed a far broader range of human aspirations. And it was only really with the birth of modern economics that this notion becomes kind of whittled down. It loses this flexibility and becomes reduced to economic interests and then becomes equated with self-interest. Now, clearly, and I'm certainly not the first to say this, but this narrower formulation of interest um, excludes many uh, aspects of welfare, many types of aspiration which might be of concern to individuals. For example, concerns about the welfare of others are pretty much um, reduced to rather instrumental or pragmatic considerations, or concerns about integrity um, or about um, legacy, or th th things like that that don't neatly fit into this utility or self-interest formulation simply aren't really captured by this model. And it also overlooks that these interests can be shaped through social interaction, of course, and that our interests aren't just developed um, um, uh, within us as sort of individuals, as it sort of inherent drives, or, uh, but, but they're constituted and shaped through social interaction. Um, so this leads us to the question, might our doubts about interests and these critiques of this egoism claim, could they be, be addressed by um, perhaps loosening up the concept of interest and saying, well, we can return to the sort of more classical idea of interest and, and allow interest to encompass a broader range of aspirations. And we could acknowledge that interests are socially constructed, that they're developed through interaction with those around us. And this is what Swedberg suggests. He said, look, interest is a really useful concept within social science. It is really useful to be able to explain behaviour or action by invoking the concept of interest, but just not this narrow formulation of interest. Let's loosen it up and let's do what the classical thinkers did and, and um, be more flexible and open to a wider range of interests. But the problem is, and here, this, is my, this is my argument now, that, that it's not just the content of interests or even the source of interests that's the problem. It's that interests, however narrowly or however broadly conceived, um, the problem is if we try to invoke that concept of, concept of interest to try to explain action. And my point is that we can't pick and mix our assumptions. We can't keep the shell of this interest formulation, so the shell of this idea that interests drive or explain action, without consequences for the way we understand social action. I'll just explain what I mean by this. Um, First of all, if we start broadening out what counts as an interest, yeah, so we accept that various other aspects of, of well-being or welfare count as an interest, it's not just this narrow, egoistic conception, then the concept rather loses it, 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 its explanatory power. So if we, we admit a broader range of interests, then we're basically covering all possible types of goals or aspirations that might motivate action. And this construction then becomes a tautology. It's a bit like the revealed preferences approach in economics. Basically, anything goes. Any type of aspiration can be categorised as an interest deriving from any source. And the only way of identifying the existence of such an interest is to observe behaviour. So we infer interest from observing how people behave, but we also explain behaviour through referring to those interests. So we end up going round in circles. Um, Interest explains behaviour, but we can only infer what those interests are by observing behaviour. And if we do this, then interest really kind of loses its explanatory purchase. Um, but a separate argument, and perhaps more, more worryingly, I think, sticking with this formulation, this idea that interests drive action, creates a problem of slippage. So let's say we've admitted that interests can involve a broad range of different sorts of goals and aspirations, and that these interests can be shaped by our social context. 
If we now try to explain action in, in terms of those interests, we end up focusing on a very narrow part of what drives behaviour. We just focus on how these various goals and aspirations are grouped together or ordered by a particular individual or group at a particular moment in time. So we end up privileging certain units of analysis, individuals or groups, identified as driven by particular interests. And in doing so, we lose sight of the broader social context and we lose that relational aspect. Um, we become focused on those individual units rather than um, analysing the context in which those attitudes and actions are formed and continually adjusted. So we only end up understanding a small part of what motivates behaviour. So the point is, even if we extend the conception of interest to admit a broader range of aspirations or goals, um, by sticking with this basic formulation that interests drive action, we're still prone to slip back to this atomistic approach with all the problems that implies. Now, of course, if we renounce that atomistic approach, we do lose something, we lose quite a lot. Yeah, so this approach, the atomistic approach, the methodological individualism, um, it enables the formulation of quite clear and demarcated concepts for scientific investigation. Um, and if we assume that social science is analogous to natural science, then we need stable theoretical and empirical units of analysis. We need to be able to chop up systems into discrete parts, into manageable units of inquiry, um, a bit like particles in science. So this is, this is the sort of particles um, uh, approach. Um, but in so doing, we, 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 we fail to capture this relational aspect of social behaviour, which I think many of us would, would argue is so important. So that, that was the second sort of um, engagement, um, critiquing interests. Um, now the third phase covers the last couple of years that I spent in Hamburg and really my time since arriving in Edinburgh in 2006. And what's distinctive about this phase is, and Joe again already mentioned this, is my interest in this literature from organisational sociology. And here I really want to invoke the memory of my former friend and colleague Mikhail Bomez. Um, now, Mikhail was really the most brilliant theorist I've ever met, and he had a huge impact on his work until his death in 2010, um, which was really terribly tragic. Um, but but he, he really had, he was such an important figure in my intellectual development, um, so I wanted to mention him. Um, but he, in particular, drew, me, drew my attention to this body of literature on organisational sociology uh, and also systems theory. Um, which have really influenced my thinking. So, I mean, at the time I, 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 I came into contact with Mikhail and started um, um, drawing on this, this sort of body of research, I'd just started a project on how policymakers make use of research. And I was investigating a trend which I'd observed in um, government departments working on migration policy of setting up a new research department to sort of signal that they were uh, uh, their policy was evidence-based. And this had happened in the Home Office in the UK, in the German Federal Office for Migration um, in Nuremberg, and also in the European Commission. There was this trend, it was very modish, to commission research and to set up research units within migration policy-making um, bodies, organisations. But in practice, it seemed quite clear to me and many other migration researchers that despite the sort of rhetorical commitment to evidence and research, um, much of this research just simply was being sidelined in practice. It wasn't really being drawn on to inform or adjust policy. So it presented a bit of a puzzle. On the one hand, this ostensible interest in thro throwing a lot of resources at research, and in practice, um, pretty much sidelining research in policy making. Well, the organisation on sociology, uh, sorry, the organisational sociology literature um, offered a really interesting angle from which to explore this question. And this literature suggests that organisations aren't engaged in any straightforward way in maximising power or increasing efficiency. Instead, they're preoccupied with a range of other sorts of tasks. So on the one hand, um, a very important function of organisations 
um, is to establish routines and practices and norms that reduce uncertainty and that help their members make sense of a very complex environment. And organisations establish different roles um, uh, to provide an opportunity for staff to sort of fulfil expectations about appropriate behaviour. Um, so it provides members of organisations with an opportunity um, for social recognition and affirmation um, by performing certain types of roles. Now these roles and norms and practices take on their own momentum so they can become quite decoupled or quite independent of the organisation's formally mandated goals or what it's sort of formally, um, uh, formally supposed to be um, 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 achieving. However, organisations, I mean, that's, that's the question of internal legitimacy. Organisations, however, are also concerned about ensuring their persistence or their reproduction. And this requires securing support and resources from key actors in their environment. Um, so they're also keen to act in a way that meets the expectations of these actors in their environment, whether those are customers or clients, political leaders, shareholders, regulatory agencies. So they're concerned about this outward-facing aspect of legitimacy, external legitimacy. Um, now, external legitimacy is particularly important in trying to make sense of this puzzle which I described, why policymakers, on the one hand, invest a lot in producing research and signalling their commitment to research, and at the same time seem to ignore its prescriptions in practice. Well, using research isn't necessarily valued by organisations as a means of sort of instrumentally adjusting guiding policy, but it has far more symbolic value. It's a way of meeting expectations about appropriate patterns of policy making. So organisations signal that they're acting in a way which is credible by being seen to draw on evidence and have the capacity for making sound and solid uh, decisions. And this certainly seemed to be the case with the three organisations that I studied in this project, the Home Office, the European Commission and the German Federal Office for Migration. Each was operating in different ways, each was operating in this environment where a lot of um, uh, kudos was attached, a lot of importance attached to signalling that these organisations were making evidence-based decisions. And so the use of research, at least in the area of migration policy, was largely symbolic. So how does this relate to the critique of interests? Well, this organisational sociology approach um, implies that organisations can't be understood in terms of maximising interests or maximising power. It's much more, or their behaviour is much more akin to what March and Olson have described as a logic of appropriateness. Behaviour is driven by the desire to meet expectations about appropriate behaviour um, more than to maximise goals or to ensure the optimal realisation of the organisation's mandate. So if we need to characterise the drive, in a sense, underpinning organisational action, it's this quest for legitimacy, or what we might call a process of legitimation, rather than the pursuit of interests. So how do we bring these three critiques together? <laughs> So just to, just to recap on the three critiques, well, the first critique was this PhD research which identified this dichotomy um, way of, th or the sort of dichotomy approach to thinking about moral motivation that individuals abstract from their interests and adopt this impartial perspective where they're um, uh, motivated by reason. Um, and I argued that actually motivation needs to be understood as far more relational. It's not derived from individual drives or through a process of rational deliberation, um, but it's grounded in a capacity for empathy and a process of internalising uh, uh, social norms. And once we see behaviour in this relational way, then interests just simply become a confusing distraction. They fall out of the picture. So this first point was really a point about um, motivation. The second was a critique um, based on, or a critique of this quintessential um, interest-based approach, this model of homo economicus. And I argue that this model is committed to implausible assumptions about egoistic motivation 
and this very atomistic view of social explanation. And as I said, this is a very old critique, but the distinctive point I tried to make was that we can't pick and choose which bit of the model we use. Um, if we retain the concept of interest as a way of explaining action, I argued that we end up slipping back into this atomistic approach. So we build up this picture of individual action as so fundamentally shaped by social relations that we can't begin to understand what motivates people just by focusing on interests. Now the third critique of organisations and organisational action in some way borrows from these two earlier critiques and it rejects standard claims about the content of organisational interests. Um, so according to organisational sociology accounts, um, organisations are not motivated by the desire to maximise their interests, but by a logic of appropriateness. And as with individuals, um, behaviour is deeply influenced by beliefs about appropriate behaviour. Now this organisational sociology account also offers an alternative theory of motivation which might be relevant to understand politics. Legitimation, or the quest for legitimacy, replaces the notion of interest as the driver of organisational action. Now, just a very brief aside on the concept of legitimation. So, I, in a sense, this concept of legitimation parallels the idea of recognition that I discussed earlier. So, both of these concepts, recognition and legitimation, they convey this notion of acknowledgement and, importantly, the acceptance of the validity of certain um, uh, claims or types of behaviour or traits. Um, but legitimation goes further than recognition. It implies that the actor or entity being recognised is also acknowledged as deserving a particular type of trust or responsibility. And I think this makes the concept particularly well suited for describing motivation in the political sphere. Um, political actors, whether politicians or officials um, or the organisations in which policymakers work, are preoccupied with securing a form of recognition that validates their authority um, in making policy or taking decisions. So what are the implications of these critiques for how we understand political behaviour? Well, I think now I'd have to pause for a second and probably take a little sip of water and a deep breath and confess that I'm not going to offer <laughs> a fully-fledged, perfectly formed theory of recognition or legitimation now. This is probably going to be the project of the next 15 years. Um, um, so this final section is very much under construction. But what I want to offer is a few, just throw out a few ideas of why I think these concepts of recognition and legitimation uh, are useful for understanding politics. Well, first of all, let's recall this predominant account of um, political behaviour in mainstream political science. So this is the idea that individuals and groups are motivated by a desire to maximise their utility or self-interest. And secondly, that politics is the process whereby these competing interests are mediated or brokered and transformed into outputs or policy. So what do the three critiques that I've outlined today imply for these two uses or usages of interest within political science? Well, what I've argued today certainly cast doubt on the first claim that political behaviour is motivated by self-interest. Could we replace this idea of interest with a notion of motivation uh, as driven by a desire for recognition or legitimation? I think this does, not surprisingly, I think this does describe uh, many aspects of political behaviour. And I've certainly found it very useful in understanding the organisations which I've studied. I mean, for example, the Home Office, take the Home Office, lovely example. It's certainly not advancing some interest in maximising power or control. Uh, various reforms since the mid 2000s suggest that this organisation rather gladly sheds major areas of competence and hands them over to other organisations. Um, and it's equally difficult to discern any interest in trying to exert control over the population. I'm probably exaggerating a bit, but it's difficult to see how this organisation is really acting in this Foucauldian way of trying to maximise control over, o over the population it's, it's supposedly steering. Um, I mean, the Home Office has been spectacularly 
uninterested and inept at controlling illegal immigration, um, except where it sporadically surfaces as a major political scandal. Um, so the Home Office, I mean, as far as I can see it, is a beleaguered, reactive organisation engaged in constant firefighting, attempting to retain its credibility um, to the outside while trying to retain the loyalty of a very embattled and demoralised staff. That's, that's my view of the Home Office. So it's a lot more to do with internal legitimacy and um, uh, reconciling that with external legitimacy rather than a kind of um, interest model. Um, but what of politicians leading these government departments. Surely they're trying to maximise votes. So surely in that sense, they're kind of maximising and their interest in max is in maximising power through securing public support. Well, yes, of course, they are engaged in that process of competitive um, mobilisation of support and they're concerned to meet public expectations. But as with the case for officials working in um, government um, um, organisations, the motivation of elected politicians seems to me to be far more plausibly captured by a notion of a desire for recognition. And I'm looking at Kitty now and thinking I mustn't put her wrong. <laughs> um, um, I mean, on the personal level, I think it's much more plausible to see politicians as driven by a desire for approval or status or prestige. I don't think the quest for power in any raw form could plausibly be seen as an explanation for political behaviour. And anyone who saw that appalling BBC drama, The Politician's Husband, <laughs> recently on TV, I can see some nods, will see that, you know, that, that description or that, that account of, of sort of power-hungry, power-maximising politicians seems completely idiotic and implausible. That's a bit of a straw man, I know. Um, but the second question, um, the process of politics. Um, can we understand the process of politics as captured by the idea of recognition or legitimation? And I'm on much thinner ice here, and this is a huge and very complex question, which I can't possibly do justice to this evening within the last three minutes I probably um, have left. But I'll just leave you with a few observations about the nature of contemporary politics in, in liberal democratic states. I think there are very good reasons to think that political contestation has outgrown the interest model that emerged in the 1950s. And certainly with the decline in traditional categories of collective identification, such as class or religion or profession, it's not so easy to ascribe uniform or predictable patterns of interest to different social groups. And meanwhile, many, perhaps most, areas of contestation are now post-ideological. And as many authors have noted, we've moved beyond this classic battleground of left versus right. In fact, the types of issues that, that, that mo are most likely to create political contestation and political scandal seem to revolve much more around the state's failure to protect citizens from risks or from harm. I mean, think scandals about uncontrolled immigration or um, banking crisis or public health scares or terrorist threats. Um, now, we could dissect each of these issues and, and dissect it in terms of the ramifications for individual welfare, um, as some, some commentators have attempted to do. But I think this exercise of breaking down these costs into, in, into units of individual utility appear at best to be very contrived. I think most political contestation, at least in more prosperous liberal democratic countries, involves debates about how the state can or should intervene to steer quite complex social and economic processes and how it should or how it can protect citizens from risk. Now, this is certainly not to say that inequality does not exist, and it's you know, more apparent than ever in the UK at the moment. But the point is that disparities in wealth or rights don't appear to be the key drivers of political claims making or political contestation. And if that's the case, we need to fundamentally reconsider what we mean by interest and quite how useful it is for characterizing political conflict. So in conclusion, am I suggesting that we can completely dispense with the concept of interest in political science? I think that would be a very tall order. It's such a widespread way for actors to construct 
and classify their own aspirations. And this methodology of breaking people down into manageable units, as with particle physics, has such enormous appeal to so many social scientists. But the more I think about it, the more I think it misses the mark that recognition is where it's at, because it captures the relational aspect of social action so well, and because it captures what seems to me to be a more fundamental driver of behavior, this desire for recognition or legitimacy. And I hope I've just convinced you, of, well, perhaps gone just a little way to convincing you of this, or at the very least, maybe just made you a little bit more skeptical when you're told that politics is all about interests. Thank you. Congratulations. Uh, Christina. Congratulations. That was brilliant. Um, I think it's, it's, it's really um, outstanding to come and talk to someone who's, who's uh, you know, achieved so much in their career and yet has m so much um, time and opportunity to develop. Um, uh, you, you know, you've been here in Edinburgh, what, seven years now? And you've already achieved such a loss. And, and all these reinventions are really very, very powerful uh, tropes of, a, of an intellectual life well lived and, and still to develop. But also a collegial life well lived, because I think um, many of us in this room, I know from, from your own very generous comments on, on some work that I did um, earlier on when I used to have time to do that sort of thing, um, and, uh, and, and the many uh, students and early career researchers that you've mentored and the many colleagues that you've supported and the many colleagues that you're supporting in the REF process as well, um, that what a collegial um, person you are, what a great colleague you are, and what a great asset you are to the University of Edinburgh. So, Christina Boswell, Thank Professor of Politics, Thank well you. done. This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh.